So we will just give a few minutes here, or not even a few minutes, just a few seconds, really. Some people in the door, we welcome you on this wonderful Wednesday afternoon. We're live in the Bay Area, or at least I'm live from the Bay Area. <laughs> My people here, I'm all around. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we? Let's just have a quick round robin. Where are, where are we? I'm San Francisco. Who? Oh, it's I'm San Francisco. Berkeley. Mendocino. I heard Berkeley. Then I heard. Did I hear Kansas City? Mendocino. Oh, just close, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also San Francisco. Um, I'm currently currently in Sacramento at my parents' house. All right, fantastic. Well, let's go ahead and get going. Um, welcome to the SCORES Poetry Summit, Words in Action. My name is Colin Schmidt. I'm the Executive Director of America SCORES Bay Area. It's my honor to, to welcome our guests, um, our special guest to the summit um, and to those that can attend here live today. Uh, I'm reminding everybody that these sessions are archived. Um, we hope that this is engaging with those that, folks that are here. And then again, this will be available for replay within the Hay Summit site and also later on the store's YouTube channel. Um, before I introduce this, this session and turn it over to um, our, our host, Tamsin, I want to thank uh, also our sponsors of the, of the Poetry Summit. Soma Equity Partners and the SAC Group. They help make this possible. Um, I wanna share that America Scores is the home of the poet athletes. We're running uh, free accessible programs for youth, public school youth all over the Bay Area. And we're affiliated with 11 other cities across the country, also in Canada. Uh, and we, we deliver a magic mix of poetry and soccer and service learning. So when we talk about poet warriors and poet activists, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, SCORES students as well. So this has just really been inspiring the whole summit and this session um, I know will be informative and inspiring. And um, again, we're proud to, to have you uh, sharing. The last thing I'll say is that somebody in our live audience will be getting um, will win a raffle prize, a SCORES poetry gift bag uh, with some swag and also two complimentary tickets to a, an event that we have in April, Rising Voices uh, event where we have some of our students, our poet athletes featured along with a professional spoken word artist. So um, that event's coming up soon. So I will turn it over to Tamsin. Tamsin is not only the host of this um, session, um, she herself is a, is a poet, an author, an artist, an advocate, and many other things, a mom. Of, uh, uh, I could go on and on. One of, the, you know, one of the most interesting people we know, Tamsin, and has helped us organize this summit, not only the session, but uh, Tamsin along with uh, Dean Radar, uh, at USF, um, we shout out to both of you for helping us assemble um, this amazing group. So Tamsin, please introduce uh, yourself more formally and, and the panel and the subject of today's session. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Colin. And thanks for the opportunity to spend an entire week on poetry. This is kind of one of those offers you can't refuse. So um, uh, I've enjoyed all the sessions and I have to say this one is, is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, from the time I walked into Beau Beausoleil's um, bookstore, um, the Great Overland uh, Book Company was the name and um, finally met the person that was one of the key figures behind an anthology that I had treasured, um, which was called Al Mutanabi Street Starts Here. And all of the people um, that you're gonna meet in this discussion have a connection to that project, a, in some cases, a connection to that place. And we're gonna hear from all of them as well as um, some readings. So um, discussion and readings. But I thought I would just begin for those of you who don't know what and where Al, Al Mutanabi Street is, maybe you join because you're interested in building a movement and, and social action around 
um, the literary arts, and that's how you found your way here. Let me give you just a little bit of uh, background and um, just to kind of ground you in the discussion. So um, uh, we're, we're talking about an event that occurred in March of 2007. There was a car bomb that exploded um, uh, in a famed literary corridor in um, the heart of Baghdad, um, the old city in Iraq. And um, dozens of people lost their lives, um, hundreds were injured, and it was a, um, a, a horrific event midway through um, the war. And it um, was shocking in the way that any time news like this is, um, and people lose their lives, but I think particularly for people in the literary community, the thought that an attack had been waged against um, you know, a, a sacred space, a place of literary and intellectual gathering and community and um, the loss of life as well as the loss of, um, or the threat to the spirit of um, free expression and free exchange of ideas was um, uh, intolerable to a lot of, um, to a lot of people. And um, what we're gonna talk about now is uh, not just reading the news, and being upset and saying that that's intolerable, but actually doing something about that. Uh, and um, so, you know, we'll we'll talk about how this movement uh, began, how it's grown. Um, but we have a, a special person. Um, we have a lot of special. All of our panelists are special, but um, a surprise addition as we were putting this together is um, to hear that um, there is a gentleman, Hamza Al-Haidari, who is not only, I believe, a poetry coach and a soccer coach at America Scores, but has a very special connection to Iraq because he is from there. Um, and his family um, has spent quite a bit of time on Al Mutanabi Street. And so before we get into the discussion, I've asked Hamza, he has photographs. so. Um, uh, it, it is always good to have a picture in one's mind of, of what you're talking about. So Hamza, if you don't mind, can you, can you show us what we're talking about, please? Certainly. Uh, first of all, thank you, Tamsin, very much. That was a very kind introduction. Uh, thanks for having me to be part of this discussion. I think before I share photographs, I'd like to just paint an image with words here to uh, give an idea about the importance, the significance, and what this street means to Iraqis, and, and specifically, and uh, folks who are who love literature in general. And Mutanabi Street has been a cultural and a, liter a, a literacy hub in the center of Baghdad for a little bit over a hundred years now, and it's named in Mutanabi after a very famous Arabic poet who uh, lived several hundred hundred years ago. And he was one of the uh, pioneers of the Arabic language and the modern format that we know of today. I recently got my hands on a book that includes most of his literary, literary work, and it's around 400 pages in Arabic, and I've been diving deep into it, and I absolutely love the poetry he writes. Uh, so the street is named after him, and the street is more than just a place to exchange books and sell books and discuss uh, literacy. It is a place where um, families meet, a place where issues get solved, a place where celebrations ensue, and a place where people become, become the best version of themselves just due to the surroundings that they're in, especially in a country that's been war-ridden for the last few decades. Um, I, my most recent trip to that street was back in 2016, actually, and one of the best things that I saw that I wish we had more of in the world in general was there were all these casebos in public areas that were, uh, you know, covered from the sun, and people had met in those casebos and would discuss some of the problems that they have, whether it's in their neighborhood or their community or uh, whatever is close or intimate setting that they're in. And I saw a sign that absolutely caught my eye, and that's the part where I wish there was more of in the world. The sign said it was in Arabic, and it had it said you are not only responsible for what you say today, but you are also responsible for what you don't say when you should have said it. And I think um, 
a place like that would be the place to foster such culture and, and plant such conversations. Now, without you know, more, more talking about it, I, I did ask my aunt who lives in Baghdad and she kindly enough went to the street. She actually had a, she had a, a, a date with her friends. Um, I had talked to her on that Wednesday and she said, oh, well, believe it or not, we're going on Friday. I'm meeting with my friends for lunch and we're gonna do a tour of the street. So I'll take pictures for you. <laughs> but she kindly enough took, took some of the most recent pictures of the street. Uh, during the pandemic, and I'll share my screen here to share some of the images. Uh, the street lies in the center of Baghdad, just to the eastern side of uh, the Tigris River, and that side is what we call Ar Rasafa. Please let me know if you're able to see my screen okay. Yep. So this is a, a close shot here. This is a bookseller and a bunch of uh, street goers and book buyers, and that, this is what it is. There is a bunch of stands or blankets on the ground, and you can see it. this is cars are not allowed, this is pedestrians only. And people with books show up and have their books out there. There are shops to the right and left of, of where this image, what we're looking at. And those are the shops that are even more libraries, so more books. And people just walk around and discuss books and look for any book that you may be looking for. And you may, there's a really good chance you'll find it there. So this is, this street, this view stretches for about a kilometer actually. And through it, through that kilometer, there's all kinds of life that lives within there. Now, this is a statue of al mutanabi the poet that the street is named after. Um, and this lies at the very end of the street, right on the Tigris River. So from this statue, if you continue to walk to the right, and if you see here, there's, I think, a gentleman or someone sitting down wearing a flannel shirt, just from where this person is sitting, if you walk right past them, you could for about $5, you could get on a boat and get a tour of the Tigris in Baghdad, which is really cool. So this is who the street is named after. And then this is the entry of the street. So there is a, this big um, arching gate that welcomes you in. At the top over here, it says al Mutanabi Street in Arabic. Um, and then you walk right in through here and then you get to enjoy all the culture and the books that you could possibly imagine. If you pay close attention, this, this area has not been renovated. It's been kept as, as it's been for the last few hundred years. So this old style of architecture and building sort of coincides with that smell of um, old pa papers from the books. There is some magic to that, that I, I could try my best to describe, but it's <laughs> only best when it's, you, you can only really feel it. I, th I hope I, I drew, I hope you're smelling what I'm smelling right now <laughs> as, I, as I look at this picture. And then you continue on and you continue to see these sites of folks just discussing different kinds of books. You can find some of the most random books in there from children's books, psychology, atheism, religious books, literacy, poetry, politi politics. When I was there in Baghdad in 2016, I saw Michelle Obama's um, a biography translated in Arabic being sold on the street as well. And I, was, I just thought, wow, what a, what a diverse collection of books. Um, more pictures of that, of that nature. You could see that there's just piles of them and people are continuing to just chat, be there, be together, be a community and um, just enjoy the atmosphere. This has become a big hub um, in the most recent years. This is where a lot of people will come out and share ideas and talk about different aspects of, of projects or movements or campaigns that they're planning. In the time that I was there, I, I learned about a new marathon in Baghdad that was taking place for charity and they were promoting it through the street and you could sign up in, on the street, you pay in cash, you, they write your, your name down, you show up to the day of the event and it was called Marathon al Salam, which means Marathon of Peace. Um, it was a really cool concept. And then um, this is an old photo and, and this is the part where I have a, a personal connection to the street. My grandfather, Shamsuddin Al-Haydari and his father, Abdul Amir Al-Haydari were uh, among the pioneers who started this cultural hub in Baghdad in the early 1900s. Uh, this is from the very first um, book exhibition that they had put together. And I believe this is in the late thirties according to our family's archives. And um, these are all poetry books and 
the gentleman right here in the glasses pointing at the books, that's my grandfather. And there's just a bunch of folks out there who are uh, there at the exhibit to see what's going on. And um, selfishly, I added a close up look of my grandfather here in his library. He had a publication house and a library and a bookshop. And his name is Shamsuddin Al Haideri. And he's just been um, a role model figure for me. I, I grew up in his house. I, he passed away in 2001. Uh, but I, I spent the majority of my childhood just in that library, um, learning how to sort books and shelves and learning how to make a hardcover um, of different books and so on. So it was a really cool experience, really cool childhood, uh, despite the abnormal environment that was surrounding it. It was uh, some of the best memories of my life. And so just for the sake of time, I will stop here. But I hope that got you a closer image and a feel to the street and the um, campaign that we're going to be chatting about today. Oh, Hansa, that was wonderful. I'm kind of choked up. It's have, thank you so much for sharing your your family with us as well. And it's um, for someone who's looked at a lot of photos from 2007 at the destruction and read a lot of poems about um, you know the cinders of books and. Um, of lives flying through the air to see the resilience and the flourishing of, um, of the street come back to what it had been um, is, um, uh, is very powerful. Uh, so very much. yeah, that, that was, and I wish we could be taking a field trip <laughs> maybe one day. <laughs> I would love to be your tour guide, I'll take I would. I think we found the exact right tour guide. So um, people clamoring, but, um, I, if I can take us back to 2007, um, because that's really the seed of um, what we're going to discuss now, um, where the pictures were not um, uh, were were very distressing, um, and um, I do have pictures yeah. from the day of the bombing. Actually, I just chose not to include them. Okay. Um, I could share them if you'd like to see what that destruction looked like at the time. Yeah, but I do have a couple of those from that day. Okay, well, maybe we'll do, I'm not done with you, so I'm going to come back to you. <laughs> um, but um, Bo, if you can take us back to you reading this news, um, you know, in March of, of 2007, uh, I don't know if you were sitting in your bookstore or sitting at home, but um, take us back and um, put us in your shoes. So uh, I'm a poet and in 2007, I had a bookstore. Uh, on, on Judah Street here in San Francisco. So I was at my kitchen table reading the New York Times and I read an article about a uh, car bombing of a street, Al-Mutanabi Street in Baghdad, the street of the booksellers. And like a lot of people who had marched against the war, um, I was always kept at a distance from the Iraqi people by my own government. Uh, and I couldn't find a way to step in. Uh, when the bombing happened, I realized that as a bookseller, that's where my bookstore would be. I, I was a used bookseller. As a poet, that would be my cultural community that had been attacked. And the distance between myself and the Iraqi people just dropped away. Uh, and I took that step. But then I did uh, what a lot of people do. I waited for somebody to respond. I mean, San Francisco is a city that is just full of writers and artists. And so I knew that somebody was going to step forward and put together a memorial reading a reading in support of the booksellers and readers of Al-Mutanabi Street and of Baghdad and of Iraq. And I, every day I would look in the paper and I well, was nothing. And I could feel this whole idea of connection just kind of slipping into the rabbit hole of history because every day was more carnage coming out of Iraq. So I, I did something that a lot of people who become organizers do. First, you wait for somebody else to do it. And when somebody doesn't step forward, you do it. 
And so I waited 10 days and I started calling people up. And uh, by August of 2007, we had collected um, letterpress broadsides addressing the bombing. And we had um, had a reading at um, the San Francisco Public Library. The center for the book in San Francisco, when I told them about what I was trying to put together, they just simply said, what can we do to help? And they produced the poster for it. And a small network of printers and artists began to grow who wanted to contribute to this. And after the reading, usually in, in moments of protest, our own government counts on there being a protest, a march, a feeling of solidarity, and then everyone goes home. And the important thing is that everybody goes home. Well, after we did the reading, I realized I didn't want this to go home. I wanted this feeling of solidarity with the Iraqi people and all that they had endured and were continuing to endure to go forward. And I could see that what was happening in our own literary community and in our own arts community around the idea of addressing this bombing on Al Mutanabi Street uh, was bringing people together. Because a great part of this project, much like scores, I think, is about singular artists and writers all contributing to a collective voice. And that's the important part, is the collective voice because that's where our power to address things comes from. So I wanted to continue. And I tried to think of ways, how do I continue this project? And so I began to use parts of the book arts to address things. Like I put out a call with the aid of a printer to um, more letterpress printers to do broadsides, large, pieces of paper printed on one side, handset, uh, addressing the bombing with poetry, both from uh, the West, but mostly Iraqi poetry. Uh, so we did that. And after a few years, we had 125 broadsides. They now reside as part of the permanent archive in the National Library of Iraq in Baghdad. Uh, we donated them to them. Then we moved to artist books. And those are books that artists create by hand and they put so much of themselves into those books. We called that project an inventory of Al Mutanabi Street. So we have 260 book artists from 20 different countries all contributing books that have now been exhibited uh, all around the world from Baghdad to Egypt, uh, to Sweden, extensively through the UK, through Canada, through the United States. Uh, our project has then moved into printmakers and we have more than 200 printmakers who are part of the project. We moved from there to bookmarks. We started making book, getting people to make bookmarks that said Al Mutanabi Street starts here, and then placing those bookmarks in books, in libraries, and in bookstores. Because it's the idea that wherever someone sits down and begins to write towards the truth or picks up a book to read, it is there that Al Mutanabi Street starts. And now we have a photography project that honors Iraqi academics who were targeted and assassinated between 2003 and 2012, uh, asking people to address those assassinations, trying to make a connection with only a bit of fragmentary information 
The project is constantly about trying to find a meeting place, a place where both um, people in the arts, the arts communities in Iraq and people in the West can stand, can come together to try to create something. And that's not easy. But I think it's really important. One of the first things that we did with the project was to try to give cultural communities in Iraq a sense that we saw them, that what they had gone through wasn't invisible to us as artists and writers, and that we stood in solidarity. I've always said that this is not a healing project because to begin to heal things, you have to understand how extensive the wounds are on anybody. And the wounds that we left on Iraq and continue to leave there are going to be rising for generations. It's also not a project of pity. We are a project of witness, memory, and solidarity, which is exactly what poets and writers and artists are all about. Okay, I, I could go on and on, but... Um, well, let's, Bo, you've talked about some of the, you know, one of the things that has always struck me about um, this effort, and I think you just touched upon that this isn't healing, oh, a bad thing happened, we're gonna, pay, we're gonna put a Band-Aid on it and, and think everything's okay. Exactly. Um, you know, and, and so you have made um, a point every year there are readings and there, there um, have been a whole series and you mentioned some of them of extensions of this through expression, you know, artist books and through the bookmaking process itself, through the anthology. And we have others on, on the call here that have been a part of that. And, you know, as we were talking a little bit amongst ourselves, um, as we first hopped onto the call, you know, poets can can go to a cafe and read their poems. But if if we don't have people to print our poems um, and make them into beautiful broadsides, um, so that there's something to put on a shelf that you can find, um, you know, in in a literary corridor in a in a foreign city, um, if we don't have people to make the books, we we don't go very far. And so maybe if you could. Um, maybe we'll start with Felicia. If you could um, introduce her, Felicia, you can talk about um, your your connection to this um, project, and um, and then we'll hear from Persis after that. So, Felicia is is um, she's been in three individual parts of our project with um, a broadside print um, artist book. Uh, and the photography project as well now. Uh, Felicia is the epitome of what the project is about. And, and that sense of collaboration, the sense of creating a collective voice, uh, that's really paramount to Felicia. So I'm honored to call her a friend. So Felicia Rice. Oh, you're muted her. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And um, I'm really honored to be here as well. I, I um, have been so happy to be part of this project from the very beginning um, and making in my uh, letterpress handset type, individually printing on presses, making images. Um, on each, uh, actually everything from the um, broadside to the artist book, to the print, uh, to the um, shadow and light, the photography project that's ongoing right now. And it was really exciting to come together with a lot of people around this issue and have them be from around the globe. And I can't tell you how excited I was when I learned that I believe it's the artist books that are in the collection in the uh, bag in the Baghdad in the National Library. Is that correct? No, it's the broadside set are there. The broadside. Um, oh, yeah. okay. But and you know, I'm like so excited. One day that they're one, there. One day we hope to have a whole set of everything the project has done in Baghdad. So, but we're yeah. still working. We're still working on that. 
but our archive yeah, is held by Columbia University in, in New York City. And I just had a, a devastating fire that took my entire studio home and all my own archives. So I don't have copies anymore myself of any of these things. So um, I'm, I'm really glad to know they're in Colombia and they exist. And I have some photos, which I've asked, uh, maybe get some help to show them um, what, what they are uh, this evening. And um, I have copies of the poems. Uh, that I printed up and worked closely with um, that I can read. So uh, please guide me as to when that might be the best time. Alicia, were you able to get the images into shareable form? Yeah. Do you want me to bring oh, them up? Perfect. Right Why don't we share them? And, and Felicia, do you want to read as we're as we're looking at the... Uh... Yeah, yeah. Just uh, put one up and I'll read that poem. I have okay. them right here. Excellent. Just give me one second to space it right. All right, can you see that all right? I can. All right. So this is the broadside. So a single sheet with a poem wrapping around the uh, Tigris River in over a map of Baghdad with uh, some aerial view. And um, this is the poem. It's called It's Destinies by Ghazar Antush. So. The retired man, the brown crane-like boy, the woman with the blue shawl, and the poet with the diamond heart are waiting for the red bus that will take them. The retired man to Cafe Hassan Ajmi, the brown crane-like boy to the Boy Scout Center. The woman in the blue shawl to Al Mansur, and the poet with the diamond heart to hell. So the Cafe Hassan Ajmi is a traditional cafe in Baghdad. And then Al Mansur, where the woman's going in her blue short shawl is an upscale uh, shopping area. So this is uh, destinies, each has their own destiny. And this is the broadside. Um, Beautiful. Alicia, if you wanna go on to the next one, I'll. Okay. One second, let me get it set up here. Yeah, this one was hard to uh, photograph because it's a scroll. It's long and narrow and you can see how it rolls up and it goes in, in the box. Um, it's titled An Excerpt from Five Hymns to Pain, a longer poem by Nazik al Malaika. Um, and I'll just read the uh, poem. It gives our nights sorrow and pain. It fills our eyes with sleeplessness. We found it on our way one rainy morning and gave it out of love, a stroke of pity and a little corner in our throbbing heart. It never left or vanished from our way, stalking us to the corners of the world. If only we gave it no drop to drink that sad morning. It gives our night sorrow and pain. It fills our eyes with sleeplessness. How do we forget pain? How do we forget pain? Who will light us, light for us the night of this memory? We shall eat it, we shall drink it, we shall pursue it with songs. And if we sleep, its shape will be the last thing we see. And in the morning, its face will be the first thing we discern. And we shall bear it with us wherever our desires and wounds take us. We shall allow it to raise walls between our longing and the moon our anguish and the cooling stream, our eyes and our sight. Mm. Beautiful. That was a, such a wonderful poem to try to present. The challenges that I face are to uh, make the poem readable generally that's the approach and to also do something visually that might could you go back one? Oh, yeah 
do something visually that might evoke the mood, maybe mm -hmm. the mood of the poem. And this was, this is sort of a, a landscape, a desert landscape, which with perhaps your sp spiky um, plants rising up and this sense of endless, endless endlessness, the endless nights, the ongoing pain. Um, you know, Felicia, it strike it may this may sound obvious, but it strikes me that um, you know that the tangibility of of these broadsides is is putting back what was taken away, what was burned. You know that the, the um, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I I mean it's 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 a restoration that's occurring. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And if I may add a quick oh. piece here just to the power of this project and what it means. The poet uh, Felicia that you just cited, Nazik and Malaika, passed away a few short weeks in 2007 after the bombing of Al-Mutanabi mm -hmm. in her home. Um, That's right. Just the incident in itself had weighed on her so heavily. Oh. Um, I, I understand that she was one of the most important women poets in the country. Very, right. very important poet. A, a modernist as well, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Five hymns to pain. And the next one. The next one was response to uh, Bo's call for a print, meaning a largely visual piece, um, not so much emphasis on the word. And I was exploring the idea of making the word less readable rather than more readable. Uh, that maybe the overprinting of the type and the uh, the wire and it would generate this kind of agitation. And in fact, you can read the poem, and I think I printed it on the back, especially so that it, I mean that is important to me. I don't want to obscure the language, but I wanted to give it sort of a, a visual setting. Um, so this one is Roots by Lamis Al Ethari. From the wounded banks of the Tigris, I had to rip them from the hard ground, watch the crusted soil crumble away, shake, shake the dirt, fall until they stand bare, naked, snap the veins break, dead leaves trail behind, sew the lips with fine wire so the words don't emerge, don't utter in the mother tongue. No, no, I have to tear and Tue Duana's pages from my heart that no longer bleeds, pull them hard from the riverbanks and walk in silence across the ocean where the soil does not give them life, nor words, nor tears. I have this trail of dead leaves, of dead branches, and my roots are staring back at me. And mm -hmm. she's uh, in the diaspora living in Canada, this poet. And she did respond to this piece um, and said it was, it was very evocative for her of, of the feeling of being um, exiled from her home. So this was the uh, print. Uh, and then I did do a photograph for, um, can, can someone tell me more about Endhe Duanas? Does, does anyone know who? It's cited in the poem, the name, um, Ende Juana's, and Enhe Duana's pages, as if it's a writer. Does anyone know? I, I've forgotten if I looked it up in the past. Sorry, I'm no help here. Yeah, I, I could do a quick search, but. Uh, so um, three really, really beautiful poems to spend time with. And I, I did, you know, uh, quite, quite a long time setting each letter by hand out of metal type, old style printing and, um, and reflecting on how best to um, present them. Beautifully done and well read Felicia, thank you. Thank you. I can't. I can't help but think about. Um, you know, I, you you mentioned you had a terrible fire, um, and in a sense, you've 
now had the personal <laughs> sensation of what it is to um, you know be exiled from your things in a sense so um send you love yeah we got that. caught in the uh, wildfires last summer in the santa cruz mountains and lost everything so um yes i have had an experience of losing the things that verify my identity mm -hmm. i have to find that identity for myself without my things yeah you know, one of the uh, broadsides that was done has, uh, it was from a printer in the UK, and it says Almutanabi Street is like a phoenix rising from the ashes. And that's like your press, Felicia. <laughs> Same thing. I did a quick search on this uh, goddess, best known, the earliest known poet whose name has been recorded. Uh, Sumerian, 23rd century BC, so thousands of years ago. Summer uh, Brenner, high priest. Summer Brenner has her in a poem in the anthology. Ah, <laughs> yeah. high priestess of the goddess Inanna and the moon god Nana. She lived in the Sumerian city of Ur. Mm -hmm. Ur, which is we associate with the essential, like the root, very heart of something is Ur. So um, yeah, this experience is very much one of those kind of Ur experiences, yeah. losing everything. Um, well, literary bridge is a phrase that I know Bo and, and others have used, you know, it, it, and that is one thing about poetry is it, it connects us across time and space, people that may be long gone in, in places we may never visit. Um, but, you know, that, that recognition that someone has tapped into the words that maybe you yourself couldn't, couldn't bring forward, but that are so deeply within you. Um, it's it's uh, very powerful to be reminded of that. So um, we have as well with us Persis, um, Karim, and uh, you are not only a poet, but an academic. And I remember hearing you read when Bo hosted a, a reading some years ago at the bookstore, and I'm so happy to see you again. And uh, if you would to tell us uh, why you're here, and I hope we'll have some readings from you as well. Yeah, um, well, uh, I just wanna say, I think it's so cool that you do sports and poetry. Um, <laughs> I wish such a thing had existed when I was a child because I neither excelled in poetry nor did I excel in athletics, but I think there's a lot of harmony in and camaraderie in both of them. So thank you for having me and thank you for um, inviting me to participate in a project that I have so much love and respect for. Um, I was, Long ago, when I first got out of college, I was very active in the war, in the effort to end the war between Iraq and Iran. Um, because, of course, we now know that that was a war that was intended to pit two Middle East countries against each other. Um, and at various points, we were friends and then became enemies with both of those countries. Um, and my background is that I'm Iranian heritage. Um, but when the, the call to invade Iraq occurred, I was one of those many of millions around the world that knew that this was um, bogus and that it was going to lead to disaster, not only for the Iraqi people, but of course for Americans. Um, and I felt very helpless um, during the period right after we invaded Iraq. And I remember I read a poem because my child was still like one year old and the the refrain in that poem was how will I explain this to him and um then you know the Mutanavi street bombing happened and I went to the reading that Bo identified in San Francisco the very first reading and I was so struck by those broadsides and I was struck by the poetry that I heard and I felt like it was this moment that called me to participate because I, 
you know, I suppose you could say that I've always been drawn to writing poems that were political in nature because I think life is uh, constituted by conflict and politics. And, um, um, and I felt like there was a place for me to say what I wanted to say. So anyway, I said to Bo, I went up to him afterwards and said, you know, I'd love to be involved. And he um, recruited me right away. I don't even remember how, but I think I told him that I had been involved in a series of anthology projects. And he said, great, will you be one of the editors for the anthology that we're gonna be putting together? So that's how I kind of initially got sucked in and then sucked deeper in. Um, and I, what I want to echo is that the um, both the the sense of what this project is about, not turning away and sort of continuously witnessing, is so compelling to me. But also um, the the idea that in some ways we're building a community that's around the globe that is the same community that wanted to stop the war, the in U.S. invasion um, in two thousand three. Um, and in some ways, the only answer we could, you know, respond with is our words and our expressions. So I'm so grateful to have been involved. And um, again and again, I'm so um, proud to be involved, but also I, I adore Bo because I think he's such a model of what poetry can and should do, which is to connect people from all over the world. Um, so I was one of the editors of the anthology. And then um, more recently, um, I, he asked me to respond to the Shadow and Light project, which was a photography, taking a photograph and, um, and having it somehow resonate with the name of the academic who was assassinated. And of course, being an <laughs> academic myself, um, and knowing a lot about how academics are targets um, throughout the world, uh, especially in places where there's conflict, I, the project really spoke to me. So I'm gonna start by uh, reading the poem that's in the anthology. Um, can you hold up the anthology so oh, sure, we can see sure. it? And maybe we can put a link in the YouTube when we post it. Yeah. Oh, great, and Felicia has it too, perfect. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the broadside that was made with this poem because it was so moving to me. Um, the poem grew out of an experience in 2004, um, not even six months or seven months into the U.S. invasion and occupation. Um, I was teaching an English composition class at San Jose State, and I got a, somehow I got a hold of a copy of um, one of the first uh, reports about casualties as a result of the US invasion. And <clears throat> I don't think it was the Lancet report, but it was a, a, it had the names of people who were killed in the first six months of the war, their city or town that they were from and their age. And it was a very, very long list. And I printed out about 200 pages um, and I brought it to my class because I decided to teach the class um, about the, the US invasion of Iraq. And I passed this um, manuscript of names around from this official report. And one of the students said, you know, what, why, why do we have to do this? It's not our job to keep track of the dead. Um, and it just struck me. And so this poem grew out of that. And um, the broadside, it's called Ways to Count the Dead, and the woman who made the broadside, um, oh, she was just fantastic, and I don't even remember her name off the top of my head, but she said, I was so moved by your poem because I did it in three printings. She did hatch marks to indicate the counting, so they were indented into the paper, then she printed the poem in black ink and then she printed the title in red ink. And she said, your poem was a meditation for me because I, every time I ran it over the printing press, I could feel the names of those dead, who, those people who had died during um, that first six month period. So this is called Ways to Count the Dead. Keeping track of the Iraqi death toll isn't the job of the United States, a student said to me 
And besides, how would we count the dead? Take their limbs strewn about the streets, multiply by a thousand and one. Ask everyone in Baghdad who has lost a brother, cousin, sister, child to speak their names into a recorder. Go to every school, stand at the front of the class, take roll for every empty desk, at least two dead. Find every shop that sells cigarettes. Ask how many more cartons they've sold this year. Go to the bus station and buy 10 tickets. Offer them free to anyone who wants to leave. Go see the coffin maker. Ask how much cedar and pine he's ordered this month. The dead don't require much. They don't speak in numbers or tongues. They lie silent, waiting to be counted. Um, so that was a, a wonderful experience for me um, to actually be so surprised by how a poem became another sort of poem in the hands of a printer. So I also really appreciated what you uh, spoke about, Felicia, and the way that you, um, as a printmaker, bring the another dimension to the poem. Um, the the project Shadow and Light. Uh, I don't know if I can if you can. Well, it's okay. I'll just explain it. Um, so when Bo asked me to do the shadow and light where I identified uh, one of the 350 names in this list of academics who had been targeted, I, it was uh, Women's History Month and I decided I'm gonna find the woman or two that are in this list. And they were mostly 95% men and only a few women. And so the one that I picked was uh, Leila Abdullah Al Saad. Um, and she holds a she held a PhD in law, and she was the dean of Mosul University's College of Law. She was assassinated June twenty second, two thousand four. And of course, on these lists of names, there's nothing else. Like you can't find a biography. Um, they're just uh, names in a list to identify. So um, I was left to the task of trying to imagine who this person might have been and the impact of their life. So this is called In the Time of Cherries. This is your name, not just your death, the day someone gunned you down at the broken stone gates in the time of cherries. I know you, Layla, just enough to know you live in those others who sat in rapt attention in your classroom, the women who believe in justice, in words and sentences, for those without a voice or any chance of speaking how they listen to you extol those large truths, the way an idea starts in the heart, then springs into the throat and one day becomes the law or even or just the principle of it, a flower that blooms in the minds of 10,000 more and doesn't know the end of a season. Layla, Layla, I want to say your name. I know you were more important than this singular caption of murder. Where do I find your story, your hopes and dreams in the lexicon of war? Like me, you might have li liked poetry and wanted to learn the names of trees and birds. Like mine, your mother must have been proud. She must have told everyone in the village, my daughter, she attends university and will soon become a doctor in law. You came from the quiet countryside where she and your grandmother were born and died, but you were taken before both of them in the big city, holding a bag of your students' papers and the letter you penned to your faculty the night before, warning them to be vigilant and guard their safety, even in the lull of early summer. The image that I had chosen was, um, uh, I have an ornamental cherry in my backyard and I was so struck by the way the light was hitting it. So I took it from below the blossoms and um, I didn't know anything about her except that she died on in what I associate in June with the time of cherries. So, and then I'll finish with one poem that's kind of the sister poem to the last one. Um, after I sent Bo the poem, he said, great, will you do another one? Could you do it? Um, about her husband, uh, the, the same uh, school, um, her husband, whose name is Munir al -Hiro, um, held a PhD in law and was a lecturer in the College of Law at Mosul University. And there's 
absolutely nothing about him. There's not even a date by which uh, in which he was assassinated. So um, the poem was inspired by, <clears throat> it was the start of the pandemic and I was walking to my bank on Ashby Avenue in Berkeley and I saw a box of books and they were uh, a collection of Henrik, Henrik Ibsen poem, uh, plays. And um, one of the books, and I just thought about books you know, lying on the street. And I thought of Al Mutanabi. Um, and one of the books was opened to a page that was the uh, title of the play called When We Dead Awaken by Henrik Ibsen. So I decided, okay, that's, that is the title of the poem. So this is for Munir Al Hiro. We Dead Awaken. She will not awaken, will not come back to life. I thought that I could carry on, would carry on her legacy. I knew I would never be half the lawyer, half the teacher she was, but I thought I could carry on, keep her memory alive. I would ask the same questions, meet the same silences, get the same look that conveyed a deadly warning. But what was her death if I did not ask? What was my freedom if I did not question? I waited for the taxi to take me home. I stood waiting in the twilight beside the gate where she was shot. I wept quietly in the darkness for Layla. Her memory awakened in me that last conversation about having children. I stood waiting and felt her near me as if in a dream, but neither she nor I would awaken from this nightmare of our country, our city, our lives. I waited and the time passed, one minute, one hour, I do not know how much time passed before I clutched my chest and sucked in the air as I fell to my knees. It was not my heartbreak, not my weak heart, but a bullet piercing my chest. The sky was violet blue and the crescent moon hung over me, but no one knows when I, the husband of the Dean of the College of Law, fell to his death on an unspecified date and time on the cool cement not far, not far from where her blood was spilled in the weeks or months or was it a whole year earlier when we dead awaken you will know those details for now i am one of those who lives in the shadow of the unmarked days of death when i tried to awaken my country oh, versus powerful amazing thank you thank you Wow. Hamza, how does it feel to hear these people that you're only just meeting? Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a crazy experience. One thing I've, I've been learned, I've learned and I continue to learn and just, uh, I don't think I'll ever grasp the depth of this concept, but the, the connection that people can have despite the geographical distance they can be from a certain subject or a center of interest is incredibly powerful. Um, my first introduction to this was through finding a very quirky connection with an Irish man I met while backpacking in Europe. And it continues to happen in other ways and shapes and forms. And I think this session and listening to this poem that or the, the series of poems that first is just cited and the project that Bo and Felicia had started and worked on is just incredible to see how much connection there is um, that's I, that's my biggest takeaway really it's, it's okay. surreal I hope someday we get to share the space in real life and maybe have some tea and and then add maybe even some wine and um, just continue <laughs> so with this. Six cups of tea would be wonderful. Uh -huh. Do you do you have a poem? So you're one of the coaches at America Scores, Hamza. So you work with the kids and I, I you, used to. I you used, used to I'm mm -hmm. a little bit on the back end of things now, but I I do scrabble and I uh, I wrote this poem more recently, sort of moved by the events of injustices that we see in the United States. And uh, there's a whole other conversation about the, the shock of understanding that the United States, United States system can be flawed sometimes. I, I continue to live in a state where I'm dedicated to finding the beautiful things in life and still, 
because I just need that for my sake and my and my well-being. And at the same time, I understand how cruel this world can be. And as someone, I, I, I reap the benefits and the privilege of being a white man in the society until my ID gets spread at an airport or in a stop. But in general, uh, male privilege and white privilege is an abundant to me, despite my background. But I wrote this poem um, just to sort of bridge the past with the, with, the, with the present. I say, how stark the hierarchy of asylum becomes when I flee the nearly faded face of the silvered moon or rough tyranny of misfired heart. Rarely is anyone wholly starving hysterical, naked, leanly shining from a lanky sky. Only this that I know, there is a language of poverty within me. And from this language, I seek to speak a tongue known by every hungry mouth. Oh. You know, mm -hmm. Hamza, it's so interesting hearing you. I mean, this, we're not gonna, spend too much time talking about the last four years, but it's been painful um, on top of, you know, prior injustices. Um, and I, I, I wanted to, I don't know if there are questions from the audience and I know we're, I'm not gonna let us go without hearing some of Bo's poems, um, but just if there is anyone in the audience that either, you know, pop a, pop a question in, in the chat if you want. And I just, I have one friend who's on the call today, who's in a, um, her name's Siana, and she's in an art crit uh, painting group with me. And um, she's Chinese and uh, had, uh, as she presented this last week, and um, in so doing, really presented um, something of a, a, a revelation. Um, and, uh, and I could feel that fire being lit within her um, as she was reacting to the stories of violence against um, Asian people and really thinking about her art and her creativity as having a different role than she, she had initially conceived. Um, and I could feel her desire to take things to the streets. And so I invited her onto this call. I'm not going to call you out, um, Siana. I just wanted to um, say that this is, um, you know, this, this is a, a discussion about um, that was prompted by an event, but I think what we're all experiencing here is, is the connectivity and the importance of people coming, coming together um, through the greatest thing that human beings are able to do, which is not make guns and bombs, but write poems and make books and touch one another. And um, so I hope that this inspires anyone listening um, with this example, but also, you know, it, this has always been a project that's about um, passing the torch, you know, Bo looked around to see who was going to light that torch. And when no one did, he said, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the spark. And, you know, when he met Persis, he handed the torch to her and said, you're going to help me edit this uh, anthology. And he did the same with Felicia, you know, we need, we need help getting this out. And, you know, Hamza, we've only been connected uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, I've known Colin and Angela from America Scores for years now, and this is the first time we're connecting. And so just that, um, that call to action, that inspiration to um, whatever it is that, that you're feeling, you know, think about what you can do and look around to see who can help you because they're, uh, as one of my great bosses once said, it's not a movement if it's just one person. Um, it's a movement when it's everyone you come across. Um, so uh, that's my editorial comment. Um, and Bo, I don't know if you want to add, and again, I'm not going to let you get away without reading some poems for us. So, Okay, I just want to add that um, all through this project, I have looked for people to be coordinators. Um, always with that idea of that of carrying this forward, of having new ideas. Um, you know, the, the thing that I contribute to this project is my stubbornness. 
and that I simply won't go away. And that's, I, you know, the projects that I have come to admire are projects that simply did not do one thing and then go home. So those are people like Black Lives Matter who keep showing up and people like the mothers in Argentina in the plaza who kept showing up week after week asking where their sons and daughters who had been disappeared were. Um, the people in the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement. I mean, I am, I really admire and want this project to be in that same way that we simply will not go away. And that is why we encourage people to have readings for Alma Tanabe Street Starts Here every March 5th or any time within the month of March. And we do that every year. And we've had readings globally for this project because it brings people together exactly as you're saying. And it reminds people that this project and all the energy that it has built is not going anywhere. We are simply not gonna go away. We remain a thorn in the side of some people. Uh, and that's the way I want it to always be. Um, so yes. And Bo, what I really love about this statement is that that's actually what Amutenabe Street has been for the last century and will continue to be. I mean, if you think about the political history of the country and the region and what had gone, what it had gone through, it could have very easily had disappeared and vanished. And this interest to keep it alive could have could have been uh, taken away just due to the change of priorities. When yes. when folks are just trying to survive, it's hard to pay attention to art and poetry. But it's a you know, in, in some of the earliest maps of Baghdad, the area where uh, Al Mutanabi Street is now is called the Scribes Quarter. So there have always been writers in that area going, going back to the founding of Baghdad in the 700s. Yeah. So, yeah. There's a tremendous energy there. You know, often people refer to Al Mutanabi Street as the third lung of yeah. Baghdad. It, correct. And I, there is actually, a, 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 I think this might be a fun trend, um, fun fact to bring here to the conversation. If you remember from the pictures I shared earlier about how there's just an abundance of books on the street, just laying on a blanket. And um, I've, I've done a few presentations here and there just discussing a little bit of the history of Baghdad. And that's part of what I show. And I've been asked what happens to all these books when it's time to go home <laughs> and uh they actually just they get pushed to the side and and just put right underneath where there is a ceiling or a roof to protect them from the weather but that's where they stay unlocked unencumbered just over there on the street because everyone who knows the street and has the spirit of that street understands one thing readers do not steal and thieves do not read <laughs> and on that simple concept and aspect nothing gets locked away at night excellent there's another saying that uh i've come across that ties here in, ties in cairo writes beirut publishes and Baghdad reads. So right. there's this longstanding relationship between the cultures uh, in the area and supporting one another and the um, role of the reader there in Baghdad, so important, so important. And that's, that's the epigram of a poem that I wrote and dedicated to Bo. <laughs> the mm -hmm. thing that you just mentioned. Yeah, it's a good one. Maybe. Very good. Yeah. In the earlier picture I had shown with the first exhibit of, of books that was that took place in Amutanabri Street that my grandfather had put together, uh, an Egyptian author, uh, I, I believe it was Najib Mahfouz, um, mm -hmm. Najib Mahfouz, I'm uh, trying to 
westernized the name of it. Um, he was, and I'm not 100% sure if that's who it was. I, th I think if my memory serves me correctly, that's who it was. He uh, came up to my grandfather after the event and said, you know, to, to your point, Felicia, um, Beirut writes Egypt, or Beirut writes Cairo prints and Baghdad reads. And he had said, well, now Baghdad writes Baghdad prints and Baghdad reads. Oh, mm -hmm. so excellent. Publishing house. Just fun fact. That's excellent. <laughs> Thank you. May I read something? Would you please? So I want to um, read something from uh, a book of poems that I wrote in honor of the October Revolution in Iraq, October 2019. So the book is called Letters to Iraq. Um, and I wanna read the introduction because I think it's important. And then I'll read uh, two and a quarter poems from it. As a poet and activist, I have been emotionally compelled to respond to the ongoing revolution that started in early October, 2019. Iraqis are seeking a country that is free of corruption, one that sheds its in, entrenched political parties and politicians, one that offers freedom equality, justice, and an end to all colonial influences. I have followed the news reports describing the momentous acceleration of people into the streets, workers, students, women, academics, professionals, cultural workers, and even the elders. In spite of being unarmed, government forces and sanctioned militias have killed over 600 people and wounded over 18,000. There have been people arrested with accompanying torture, kidnappings, and targeted assassinations of Iraqi activists. I continue to be profoundly affected by the courage and determination of the Iraqi people. When I wrote the first poem on October 8th, 2019, I thought it was a singular response to all that I was watching and reading on social media and in the news coming out of Iraq. The continuing struggle of these heroic and resolute people has motivated and inspired me to write 28 poems as of March of this year. This chapbook presents the reader with 11 of those poems. This small effort is dedicated to every Iraqi who has risked his, her life for freedom and for those who have been wounded or killed in this countrywide movement. So the poems have the same title, but with a date, and that is Letter to Iraq. This is the first one. Letter to Iraq, October 8th, 2019. You went out demonstrating searching really for freedom and justice. You march with the voices of the poor and the left behind. And some of you were shot dead in the street, but those still standing went back the next day demanding answers and change. And then even more were shot dead. And still you came back to the continuing days with your strength visible 
and, and growing. And one of you called out in hope and desperation, just give us a country. We just want a country to live in. Nothing more, nothing less. This is called Letter to Iraq, November 10th, 2019. One does not go into the street to die. One wants to be part of a public movement that forces those in power to come to their senses or leave. One wants change not the promise of change, not a panel to study change, not a worthless piece of paper pressed into one's hand. One goes into the street to truly live with dignity, not to die, but instead to fully taste each bitter sweet moment of freedom that rushes towards you like a bullet. And this uh, final is a short one. It's called Letter to Iraq, January 24th, 2020. How many reasons have they given you to become a ghost? How many mornings have you refused to back away? To back away into someone else's memory. Thanks. Thank you, Bo. Yeah. Well, we've got, uh, we've got 10 minutes left and I'm not seeing any questions. I wonder, you know, Bo, are you still looking for uh, people to respond to Shadow and Light? Is are you still taking? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you've mentioned that project, but but maybe um, uh, maybe let people know how they can access sure, the they list. Can, and, they yeah. can write me um, at my e my email. Is that something that you can put up on the on the thing, or should I say it? Um, I think they can probably add it to the YouTube if you don't mind, but you can, why don't you just say it quickly in case anyone's jotting. Okay, so all one word, overlandbooks at earthlink.net. And, and I, yeah, I am definitely looking for people to join Shadow and Light and you don't have to be a professional photographer to join. And it's basically, it's a, it's a list, unfortunately, a long list of these very short descriptions of academics that have been assassinated. Right, Sometimes 300, it's 324 of them. They were assembled by a Spanish NGO. Fragmentary information. And it's almost the, well, I'd like to say that it's an impossible project because we are trying to make a connection to someone that we will never meet, but someone that we share a common ground with, a common interior ground with. And it's important for the project to honor the idea of what ac academics are, what teachers are, not just in Iraqi society, but in every society and that Anyone who seeks power wants to control what is being taught. And part of the message of these assassinations has been not just to kill these people, but to serve as a warning to other people who are teaching that they are being watched. And that is so important because the ultimate thing for any kind of corrupt political system is to instill in teachers a self-censorship, to put a fear in you about what you should not talk about in the classroom and with your students. And so this project addresses that as well. 
Um, it's a small effort. I, I found this list by accident, really, on, on the internet. And I wanted to take these names of these people from the shadow and bring them into the light. And, and that's what all of you have done uh, with your contributions to this project. I think it's really important. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Let me start it here. Yeah. <laughs> um, can I read a poem? Yes. Since we have some time, I haven't I haven't read this one. I, this is the first, I've written a few poems for you, Bo. Uh, for the annual readings, it's uh, and uh, and have participated in shadow and and shadow and light as well. Um, but this is a this is a poem called "All Things Considered." I spend I gave up my car, but I used to drive around a lot, and I'd always have the radio on, and that was sort of where this one came from. All things considered. Your accented voice modulates the radio and everything near me. Leaning, I imagine you to keep from falling. Whoever we are, wherever we are, we are always up against whatever else remains. As separate lives go, sameness sits in atoms alone. But as you hold me from afar by your words, I know you better than those passing on the road, careless in their casual comforts. You are in me like a spine. They took your father, your brother, your neighbors, your home. They took your proud city and its alleys, parks, poems, people, so much swept litter. Sideways in a shed without a roof, you lie blinking at the sky. One need not disbelieve in time or distance to find our eyes meet. Together we follow as they gather memories unique but coefficient, fueled as fire drinks air. The short interview with you, young man, is nearly over, yet you fan the ashes of cold news and my cold heart. You were speaking of a bird in a cage, one possession that hadn't been destroyed. You'd been asked about hope. Do you still have it? Of course, you said, because the bird. In the country where I live, people speak of freedom as escape, but you hold it on your lap. The warmth of your inner world, soothing hope through filigree reeds, as a mother's ribcage held the first dream of you. The dogs are loose on the darkling plain, but you are the wind, you the flame, you because you the bird. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Colin, I saw your magical face appear at some point. Did you want to um did you want to close us out? Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah. Magic face. I've never, you know, that's I've been called a you know a lot of things, my face, but never magic. So I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so many reactions. I mean, I, I'm at I'm at a loss of words. It's been wonderful to um, be witness to this uh, gathering, to take it, to soak it in, to to be part of this um, community, the remembrance, and um, and what it means, like it's really powerful. That's all I can that's all I can muster to say. So, um, Hamza, you know, I, I feel you know more connected to you than ever before, you know, and 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 your heritage and your family, and so I'm I'm grateful for that. You know, it's um, it's through poetry, through these sharings that we become more connected. I think that's a great example of it. I did want to say uh, one of the sort of strange images that came to my mind, um, thinking about the street and the books and the books on blankets is one of the things that we do at America Scores is we have a book zone at our soccer games. 
So Persis, this is, you know, we try to bring it tight, tight together, this, this idea of poet athlete. But we literally lay out books on blankets on the side of the soccer field. And the idea is that, you know, our, our students, our, our children, the kids take them home mm. and, and build their libraries. Like we don't want them back. We, you know, if they want to bring them back, we'll take them back. But it's like, take the books, um, build your library. And um, because of the windows, right, because of that, all that it can, it can bring into a, you know, into, into a house, into a s small bedroom, it can open a world. So I don't know, maybe, maybe, not, you know, and we do this at the civic center we do it at every place we have game days, but we play in the civic center, the Stod, Stod civic center, uh, you know, the grassy area right there in the center of the city. Um, with the kids from the Tenderloin and the Civic Center and from the Mission. And my, wouldn't that be fun just to, to meet there someday with books and poets? Oh, we can get you rapping, you know, on the, on the corner <laughs> of Hulk and McAllister. And, um, I think that's the perfect il illustration of how a movement moves. Collins picking up the torch. We have Hamza suggesting a renaming of the, um, the blanket space. And I think... Um, you know, hopefully we'll all be able to gather up and we can, yeah, we can retake the city. Yeah. Well, Tamsin, what was it when I first met you, you, you had, you had this idea of this rebranding the city. So. Oh, I've always wanted, I've always, yeah, you know, Paris is the city of light, LA is the city of angels. I always felt that San Francisco should be known as the city of poets. Mm -hmm. um, and it should. So, you know, Okay, well, let's organize. All right, okay, well, good. <laughs> I got a few of them here. Good things to follow up on. Yeah. So, this. Yeah. So, yeah. So, anyways, we'll wrap this up. Uh, um, oh. This has been a. Oh, yeah, Baghdad by the Bay, of course. That's right. <laughs> Herb Kane. That's right. That's right. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, again, we'll wrap this up, but it won't be the last time that we, that we meet again, hopefully in person before too long. Um, but really the words, the images, the spirit, the love, the passion, I mean, you know, the pain, the grief, like, wow, it's, I feel like another shark attack here, Bo, like, I, I don't know how much more of this I can take. It's, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> well, speaking of shark attacks, tomorrow at noon, Dean Rader and I will be hosting the poetry shark tank. It's, it's nurse sharks only. So, you know, we'll be talking about craft and inviting anybody that's, uh, that's in the audience to share a poem and we'll work, we'll workshop it, give feedback. So, and everyone's a winner. So no, no, no harsh critique, only encouraging, nurturing words. So. You should call it puppy dog, you know, tank or something. You know, but, yeah. Well, I thought nurse shark tank, but it's confusing enough as a, you know, <laughs> anyhow. <laughs> All right. Any last words from anybody else here before we get to our dinner and our other duties here? Person. Oh, on mute. I, I cannot wait to go to the SCORES Youth Poetry Festival. So please make sure you tell us about it. I don't know if you have that, but you should. Um, and I, one of the things that I'm so um, inspired by is that we are living in a country that is so hungry for the arts and poetry, and this is the moment. So I, I hope that you know that if I can ever help you, your young folks, I would be happy to coach. I don't do soccer coaching, but I'd be happy to do poetry coaching. <laughs> well, we're coming to Mendocino soon and in Kansas City too, but but we're going to start in Mendocino. <laughs> we've got Mendocino scores going up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Bye, Bo.